Um, good morning, everybody. Right, ooh, hello. <laughs> Dave's in the room. If you have a Bible with you or a phone or some sort of device on which you can get into the word of the Lord, let's flip to James chapter 1. Last week, we looked through the first bit of the chapter and we're starting in at verse 19. And this is what we read. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word implanted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue, deceives themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Heavenly Father, thank you that your word brings wisdom, that your word is true, and we can hold to it in so many ways. Lord, bless us as we explore it and bring your interpretation, your vision of what this is saying to us into our minds this morning. Amen. So we're into James. James is a brilliant book. Um, And last week, Chris began to explore a little bit of James with us. Who can remember, and yes, this does require an answer, who can remember some things that Chris told us about who James was or what the book of James was about, the context of James? Jesus' half-brother, yes. So James was Jesus' half-brother. Who else? Something else. It's like homework, isn't it? Who can remember what we did last week? He was the person in charge at Acts 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. He was. He was. He was one of the main leaders of the Jerusalem church, and he was certainly the person at the Jerusalem Council, which was when they were dealing with the whole issue of should Gentiles have to be circumcised, all that kind of stuff. He was the person that gave the deciding talk at the end as to what they were going to do. Anything else on who James was or the context of the book of James? It was written to the 12 tribes, absolutely. He starts off saying we're writing to the 12 tribes, which may be literal. It may be that this was to the people of the 12 tribes. It may be something that means all of Christians. Theologians are divided upon that. But it's clear, and it's a part of what I'm going to come on to in a second, the book of James is written primarily, it seems, at the time to Jewish Christians. This is a book written to people who are Christians but from Jewish background. Anything else we know from the book of James? Christian life ain't easy. Absolutely, absolutely. Christian life is not going to be easy. And that's where he starts in that first bit of James chapter one. Now, James is a book that through the eons of history has caused a bit of controversy. Martin Luther described it as the epistle of straw. He didn't like it very much. Well, no, he did like it, but he had concerns about it. And through years, it's caused various different ruptures across Christianity. And often because James is a book where we start to hear about works. We start to hear about doing. And of course, as Christians, we know that the simple principle of our faith is we are people saved by grace. We are not saved by works. And yet James spends more than a chapter, in fact, several chapters, talking about this idea of doing. And so understandably, Christians through the years have looked at it and gone, okay, well, how do I make that add up with this whole message of grace? And that's what I wanted to look into a bit this morning. Now, James, we can, as I said, look at as a distinctively Jewish-natured book. It's a book that was primarily written, we believe, to Jewish Christians, probably written, and this is, again, where people are a little bit divided on when it was done, I tend to look at it and think this is probably written before the Jerusalem Council because it doesn't mention anything about the Jerusalem Council. The style of the book and the style of leadership 
portrayed in the book is that of a very early church. It's not the sort of complexity of leadership that we see in Paul's writings with elders, deacons, all these different things. It's a very early model. Um, The term that's used quite regularly in this is the Greek term for synagogue. So the meeting place is still being described as the synagogue. Um, And as I've said, no reference is made at all to that whole issue of Gentile circumcision. And this is, it would seem that that's quite a big thing. It's a very big thing to have gone on the church and would make sense to be included in this book being written to Jewish Christians. Now, there are many Christians who also believe this book was written later. We don't have a definitive answer, um, but... I tend to fall on that side of thinking it was written a little bit earlier. And so this is written to Jewish Christians, probably in home churches around the area, probably scattered, as I've said, after the death of Stephen. And it's written by James, this Jewish Christian leader. And effectively, James was almost these people's pastor. These people's pastor. This is a church that has been scattered around the little area. And so James would have been familiar, not whether he's familiar with name-to-name terms, we don't know, but certainly familiar with the culture and what these people were experiencing and going through. He knew whom he was writing to, and he knew them fairly intimately. And there comes a moment, and I think we begin to see it here, where... James embodies the true pastor that we've seen in all churches through the centuries, which is where the pastor ends up going, oh my goodness, what are you guys doing? Because, and I'm going to tell you a little story here. I've got a friend who's got a little boy, um, and I can't remember exactly how old the little boy when this story was when it happens. But anyway, daddy was in the kitchen doing the washing up. Little boy comes into the kitchen and wants to help. You know, daddy, can I help? Can I be a part of it? You know, brilliant. Let's train the kids early. And, yep, brilliant, Daddy thinks. So gets out a washing up bowl, puts it on the table, puts the soap in, gets some knives, you know, not knives, gets some forks and cutlery and things and puts it there and says to him, right, here you go. Now you've got to make sure you wash it really well and you've got to make sure you wash everything. And then phone rings. Oh, typical, just when you're in the middle of something and Daddy gets called out the room and it ends up being quite a long phone call. Daddy puts down the phone, comes back into the kitchen and stands there looking at the soap on the walls and the soap on the cupboards and every individual item in the fruit bowl covered in soap and the dog who's got a soapy back and the soap that is everywhere and says to the little boy, what on earth are you doing? And the little boy says, but daddy, you told me I had to wash everything. And we have an example here, and I'm sort of almost doing the last bit first, but it's really useful in understanding this. You've got a group of Jewish Christians who were used to the culture of Judaism. These were religious people in terms of they were used to the infrastructure and the structure of religion. They'd grown up with it. They knew kind of how it worked. And then they got this message of grace, because for Jews, it was all about what you did. Not quite your salvation, but your your faith was based on what you did. And then this message of grace came in. And it was about, this isn't through anything we've done. We are saved through grace. And they took it to this nth extreme where they just stopped doing anything. They stopped putting anything into action. And you can see the Pastor James here is going, okay, guys, well, you've got the message, but (laughs) you've kind of taken it to the extreme here. And you've lost half of what this whole thing is all about. Because I think this whole passage we see here about James is a call and a question for us of what it is to be a follower of Jesus, not a fan. What is it to be a follower, not a fan? So, into the text we dive. We have our first section. Have we got it up there? Yes, excellent. There we go. And when you first read this, and when I first read this, I looked at it and went, Mm. Okay, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. How many of us struggle with that? How easy is it in the world that we live in to be Because it's so easy to be the complete reverse, isn't it? It's so easy to be quick to speak, to be quick to anger and so slow to listen. But James here is telling us, I think, in simple terms that we need to slow down. We need to slow down. And I would suggest that's because we're constantly doing life in fifth gear. And it's so easy not to leave space 
to hear what God's saying or to leave space for God to work. Because you see, the reality of human life on earth is that we're constantly influenced by the cultures that we're in. We can't avoid it. We grow up and we're influenced by the societies that are around us. We get it, we're familiar with it, we're conditioned to it, it feels natural, and we get used to, and particularly the culture now, we get used to the quickness, the busyness, the fullness, the noise. But for most of us, how God works can end up feeling completely unnatural. And it's so often simply because we're conditioned to the world and not to him. We know how to listen to the world. We know how to take in what the world wants to show us. Is it just as easy to take in what God wants to show us? And I know in my life, so often it's not, because often I don't know how. It's familiar. We stick with what's comfortable. And how often do we end up missing out? There's that wonderful bit in Kings, that wonderful bit in Kings. It's a story I know we all know. I'm going to read it again. And it's when God is with Elijah. And it says this, And then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was that Elijah heard it. If life is so full and so busy, do we leave space to hear the still small voice? Because God's word cannot have its proper work and effect on our lives if we don't slow down and listen. And then it also talks about being slow to anger. And I think this is an interesting concept, anger, because it's something that I would suggest all human beings at some stage in their life feel. I've only known one person that I sometimes question, do they ever get angry? But they pro- I'm sure they do. They just hide it very well. Because it's just natural, isn't it? It's part of the human condition is anger. But anger itself isn't sinful. Anger itself isn't sinful. This verse doesn't say, never be angry. We see Jesus. Jesus demonstrates anger. He demonstrates it when he's casting people out of the temple, the swindlers, the money changers. And there's this great bit in Mark where Jesus is going into the synagogue and there's a man there with a withered hand and the Pharisees are all standing around to see if Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath so that they can accuse him. And then it says this, and he said to the man, silent and he looked around at them with anger grieved at their hardness of heart so anger in itself the bible suggests is not sinful the problem and this is what we see in this verse the problem is human anger because we do anger all wrong and ultimately i don't think we are capable of doing anger right without god anytime jesus was angry The anger was for the right reasons. It was for blasphemy in the temple. It was anger against the hardness of heart or against sin. Anytime Jesus was angry, the anger was focused on sinful behavior and injustice. His anger would never led to hatred of people. He was angry because people were wronged or being led into sin. In all of his anger, he was completely in control and controlled himself. And in his anger, he never became bitter. And I don't think that without God in our lives, we can do anger right. We will still experience it and feel it, but ultimately it will be human anger. And in Proverbs, we see a lot about this, don't we? There's loads of it. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man holds it back. Another one, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. 
And again, a man of knowledge uses words with restraint. A man of understanding is even tempered. And so we've got to be careful with anger. We've got to be really careful with it. And we all feel it and we experience it. We can't help that at times. Often it's more actually how we outwork it that ends up causing the problem and what we do with it when we do experience it. And there is such a thing as righteous anger. There is such a thing as righteous anger. But I would suggest we have, that's something we really need to be testing. We talked about home groups earlier, and this letter starts with beloved brothers. God gives us people around us who can help us to test things. God gives us himself and his word through his spirit to help us test things. But basically, and this is hopefully a principle I tend to try and lead my life by, if I'm not absolutely certain in my heart and my spirit, and if God is clear, not clearly speaking that it is righteous to be angry here, we've got to be super, super careful with it. So anger is not sinful in itself, but we do genuinely have to teach, treat it really, really carefully. And here, slow to anger. Make sure it's God, not human. The last bit of this section that I love, in youth group at the moment, in um, not Oasis, that's the other one, in YP, we're looking through the book of Storylines. Storylines is a book written by Mike Pilavachi and Andy Croft, who led Soul Survivor, lead Soul Survivor, just not the festival anymore. And it's this whole principle that throughout the Old Testament and the New, there are these storylines that trace threads through. And the first and foremost storyline is the Jesus storyline, that Jesus is hidden throughout the Old Testament and revealed in the New. Although, again, they say if he's hidden in the Old Testament, he's not hidden very well. In the New Testament here, I think we have a wonderful portrayal of Jesus. Has anyone spotted it? The word planted in you. Now, it is also talking about, it is clearly also talking about the teaching. We see that when we look at the Greek translation. But the word planted in you, which can save you. Can we think of other times where Jesus is described as the word? Can we think of anyone else or anything else in Scripture that's said to be the thing that can save us? So therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. Focus on Jesus and his words, which leads us beautifully into our next section. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. And here, in that first bit, we saw um, Paul, James, beginning to create this distinction between godly living and worldly living. And here he rams it home. Here he absolutely rams it home. We see this massive dichotomy between godly living and worldly living. This concept of doing it. This focus on Jesus. You could very easily read this as, do not merely listen to Jesus, so deceiving yourselves, but do what he says. Anyone who listens to Jesus but does not do what he says is like someone who looks in a mirror. The word, the truth that we have, and remembering that at the time this was a church that didn't have the New Testament. Even if this was written in the 60s, not 1960s, but you know what I mean, 60s after Jesus, um, they didn't have the New Testament that we have now in the same way. They didn't have thousands of years of theologians who'd explored Christianity and looked at how we can do this. They were a stumbling church going into what does this thing look like in terms of doing church together, doing this Christian thing together. The thing they really had to hold to was the example of Christ and the teaching that came from the people that walked with him, the people that heard from him and the people that had experienced him. We focus onto Jesus. And it speaks really well of this. It speaks a lot back to all of the teachings that we see from Jesus about the hypocrisy that he saw in the world at the time countless examples where he's sitting with the Pharisees. We heard one just earlier on. And he's saying to them, what are you guys doing? You say these things. You teach these things. Do you do them? Do you do them? What do your lives look like? And I think ultimately it comes back to this question. Are we fans or followers of Jesus? Because a fan is defined as an enthusiastic admirer. 
A fan sits in the stand and cheers for Jesus. Because being a fan doesn't mess with your life. It doesn't really change anything. You can go to church on Sunday, you can come home, you can get on with your life. Fans want a relationship on their terms. Get the benefits, but no real change, no sacrifice or commitment, no strings attached. But Jesus doesn't call us to be fans. Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Because in this day and age, I think it's all too easy to end up with churches that become a stadium full of fans, rather than communities of committed followers. I think that's what James is pointing us to here. What does it look like to follow Jesus? And again, at the end there, verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, the perfect law that gives freedom, the new covenant we have through Jesus, the new law, again, written to Jewish Christians who are completely familiar with the old law, they understood this concept of law in a way that even we, we can't now, even with all of our theology who looks into that and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, and, but doing it, they will be blessed in all that they do. And then into our final chunk. <laughs> and we start to see some quite strong language here. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. I think James here is pointing us, almost in a summary of this section, to authentic Christianity. What is it to authentically live a Christian life? And I think he asks a question, he poses us a question. We are saved by grace. But can we genuinely be saved? Are we genuinely saved if our lives don't change? If we say, I'm a Christian, I've accepted Jesus but nothing in us changes. We know that nature of repentance, don't we? Repentance isn't just saying sorry. Repentance is an act where you turn 180 and seek to move away from the sinful nature that we recognize in ourselves. That's a part of the salvation process of becoming a Christian. If there's no change, if there's no no 180, then that's not repentance. That's just lip service. That's just words. So we're not saved by any actions of our own. We're saved by grace. But people saved by grace cannot help but see elements of their lives transformed. We cannot help but be on that journey to our lives looking more and more like Jesus. Splitting this down a little bit, and I'm not going to spike the guns of future preachers here because James talks a lot about the tongue later on in the book, and he really does focus on this. But here we see this example about the tongues. They do not rein in their tongues. Put simply, James is beginning to hammer home a point he's going to make throughout this book that words matter. Words have an effect and an impact. We can do through our words and through what we say to others, actually in in the concept of what James is talking about here, just as much as through our actions, in that we can do harm and good through our words. And it's something that is all too easy, isn't it? How easy is it to accidentally drop in something that might hurt someone? Or in a bit of human anger, to let something roll away with us, and afterwards realise, oh, that might have been quite painful for somebody else. The tongue is really powerful, but also it's the thing that we know and we see it all throughout, and James will explore it more in this, we have to be most careful of because it's almost the easiest thing to go wrong is some of the things that we say. It's also the easiest thing to go right in some ways. We can do wonderful things with our words. The tongue can be a great power for good and for encouragement. And throughout Paul's letters, we see constantly this example, build one another up. Fellowship is about coming together and supporting one another, urging one another on on the journey. But James here is making that point. We've got to be careful with it. 
And he uses strong language when he says about that religion being worthless. And it echoes what we read in Luke 6. And Luke 6, verse 45 says this, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks of what the heart is full of. Isn't it just so true that the mouth can be the most direct, often representation of what's really going on inside somebody? And in this idea of following Jesus, of beginning to walk like him, of our faith being something that cannot help but be outworked in what our lives look like, our mouths and what we say can be such a picture of that. So ultimately, I think James is pointing to a really simple message here. And it's that that I've said already. That if salvation is genuine, if salvation is authentic, if we're truly committing to follow Jesus, James is challenging us by saying that our lives cannot help but be on the journey to looking more and more like Jesus' life did. Because Jesus didn't just talk or listen. Jesus did. So how do we respond to this? It's a challenging passage, and the next bit gets harder. The next two weeks, still come back for it. But James really starts to dig home into this. He really pushes this down. This is clearly a big message for only a six-chapter book. A chapter and a half is devoted to this theme. So how do we respond to this? I love that thing we saw when Jesus spoke about picking up the cross, because it's taking up my cross, taking up their cross daily. Taking up my cross taking up your cross daily. Sarah said at the beginning, what does this book say? Christian life ain't easy. No, it's not. Because the Christian life, in so many ways, is a direct dichotomy between a worldly life. The worldly life that is comfortable and familiar. The worldly life that fits in with what's going on around us. The worldly life that we know so well, that is so easy to slip back to. And our challenge is for each and every one of us, and it will be different for each of us because we're different individuals. For each and every one of us, what does it look like daily to be a follower of Jesus? Not just listening, not just speaking, but doing as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you get life. You walked on this earth in the form of Jesus. You lived a real life. The hopes and fears of all the years. You walked, you felt, you experienced, you know. And thank you that we can come to you and bring that challenge and say, God, this is hard But with you, we know that we can make steps forwards. And Lord, that is our prayer today. That you would give us that strength, that boldness, that patience, that control that so often we can struggle with in all the different areas. Whatever it is for each person here. That you would encourage and inspire and strengthen us to seek to move further on that journey of what our lives becoming more like Jesus is, is like every single day.